I'm not sure if we'll ever get as good of a run as we did with 90s Cinematic King. It was a fantastic era that saw his dramatic work adapted in some of the best movies of their time. I mean, Shawshank still stands as the greatest story. And of course, there was some of his best schlock adaptations as well, but that's a different video for a different day. No. On this episode, I want to discuss Rob Reiner's second foray into the work of Stephen King and the brilliance that is misery. But what scene defines it? Well, I think we could all agree that there are a few parts that could um, set the stage, if you will, on what makes misery, misery. Annie's meltdown over vulgar language. Paul's final f you. But no, no. If there is one that stands above the rest, it's the hobbling scene. Some of the most intense and riveting three minutes and well worth discussing. So let's get to it. I'm Lance Velchek and this is Scene Breakdown. Published by King in 1987, though the original intent was to release under the Richard Bachman name before it was revealed to be King's pseudonym, Misery got a big break with a movie adaptation in 1990. Now, I'll be honest, it's been many years since I actually read it, and this isn't a book-to-film comparison. But the themes of addiction and dark fandom were explored deeper in the book. But what Rob Reiner created may not have gone as dark as the novel, what he did give us was one of the best psychological thrillers of the 90s. Written by the same man who did Butch Cassidy in The Sundance Kid, and starring one of the greatest actors of our generation, Misery was always a higher tier adaptation, which all came from the success and admiration Stand By Me received. Hence, the return of Rob Reiner. 1990's Misery tells the tale of a famous writer, Paul Sheldon, Mr. James Kahn, nearly dying in a car accident, being nursed back to health by a nurse named Annie Wilkes, the great Kathy Bates, who also happens to be number one fan and all. And over the course of 107 minutes, Paul must figure out how to placate Annie, gain her trust, and eventually escape with his life. Now, as much as I want to talk about great moments like Paul shoving the burning script in Annie's mouth to the small middle finger through the window, or Annie giving her opinions on the institution of marriage with a jug of piss in her hands. No, but this time around, the most famous and iconic scene happens to be the one that defines it. Paul, using a hairpin, has been strategically sneaking out of his room, planning his eventual escape when he finds Annie's scrapbook. It's here we learn she was responsible for the deaths of many infants in her care at Eldridge County Community Hospital. We knew she was, uh, how do you say, it? off her rocker. But now we know to what extent Annie Wilkes is a serial killer. So Paul, being a wise man that he is, he's a writer, he plans his attack and awaits. But what he didn't realize is... My little ceramic penguin in the study always faces due south. Before he could launch his attack, he gets quickly drugged. And then he wakes up to the scene that brings us here today. The hobbling hits every beat that Misery has and does it to perfection. Paul wakes up from his doping and he's not quite there. He's a, he's a little loopy. While we cut to a close-up of Annie, whose facial expression is both creepy and curious. She's tied up Paul, bound him to the bed, and things go from polite to desperate, with Paul trying to play any hand he has left. Deny, 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 while feeling for his knife. Yet it's Bates' portrayal of Annie and her quintessential expressiveness that leads off to one of the best monologues. If they caught them, they had to make sure they could go on working. The operation was called hobbling. Listen, there's a reason she won an Oscar, and it's because of how damn emotive, unique, and precise she plays Annie. There's a true sense of innocence that it's not an act. Throughout the movie, we get glimpses into Annie's bipolar nature, but she truly thinks of herself as good. There's a bit of that, um, uh, how do I say this? Specific Western United States uh, hillbilly politeness. And what works so well is that she doesn't lose her shit as she's done prior in the movie. She doesn't go to 11, as for you, Rob, but peacefully accepts that Paul just needs more time. 
I realize you just need more time. While she's going over how she found the hairpin as his key, and how all he needs is time, Khan gives a beautiful range of emotion, while Rob Reiner slowly dollies in. I mean, listen to Bates' tone. The tone of Annie when she's describing the Kimberly diamond mines. Do you know what they did to the native workers who stole diamonds? Don't worry, they didn't kill them. It's so pure and factual, set to the sweet and somber Moonlight Sonata. It's like she's reading a book report in eighth grade. Only this one ends with uh, both your f***ing ankles smashed. Hey, please! And as we get closer and closer to Paul's realization of the inevitable, he's already screwed. Just waiting for it to finally happen. And as violent as it is in the book, with the amputation of the foot and the cauterization with the blowtorch, the sledgehammer seems far more sadistic. And let's be honest, it's all build up. I mean, the scene is no more than three-ish minutes, but we feel it. We feel it deep in our soul. And being that this was 1990, they show almost nothing. Just one ankle. Super quick. But everything else is punctuated by the bellowing screams of Paul, brilliantly executed by James Caan. Now, I do believe that if done today, we'd have got something more gruesome, like the degloving scene in Flanagan's Gerald's Game, which, you know, would be cool in its own right. I'm down. But I do love how so much is conveyed while showing very little here. There is a psychological sadism to Annie's punishment. She doesn't just do it, she explains, she tells the story. If they caught them, they had to make sure they could go on working, but they also had to make sure they could never run away. He's learning along with us where this is ending. Paul had some freedom, as small as it was prior, but with the hobbling, he's now totally stuck and fully relying on Annie going forward. You see, the horror goes way deeper than just the pain. Now Paul is fully and maybe permanently at the mercy of his captor. As a wise and majestic Nick Cave once used to title one of his documentaries, let's watch this one more time with feeling. Yes. Annie, please! Now, of course, if you're interested in more of a deep dive on the whole movie of Misery, I'll be linking Tyler Nichols and Eric Wachowski's WTF after the credits. As always, I'm Lance Velchek for Joe Blow Horror Originals. And enjoy the holidays, have a drink from me, and don't forget to tip the wait staff. Until next time, my friends. Misery. Anyone who's read the book or seen the movie knows the story, which revolves around author and Stephen King surrogate Paul Sheldon. Paul's the author of a very successful series of cheesy romance novels featuring the protagonist, Misery Chastain. The books have made Paul rich and famous, but he's at a point where he despises writing them and yearns to move on to more serious literature. While driving through a snowstorm in Colorado, Paul crashes his car, totaling the vehicle and nearly himself, but he's rescued from certain death by nurse Annie Wilkes, who, as luck, bad luck that is, would have it, knows who exactly Paul is. Turns out she's his number one fan. While tending to Paul, who was for all intents and purposes and unable to communicate with the outside world, Annie finds to her great dismay that Paul has killed off her beloved misery and what he plans on being the last of those books. But this will not do, no, no, no. And Paul goes from being Annie's patient to being her prisoner right quick. Because if I die, you die. In order to force him to write the book that she wants, she goes through extreme measures to ensure he can't get away. One measure being chopping off his foot. Great late night reading material from the master of horror, sure. But would this claustrophobic two-hander make a good film? Turns out, yes, an Oscar-winning film to boot. And so we're going to find out just what the f*** happened to Misery. We'll try to keep the curse words to a minimum. We know Annie doesn't like profanity. And in the bank do I tell Mrs. Bollinger, oh, here's one big bastard of a check. Give me some of your Christing money. See what you made me do. King says that the initial inspiration for the book was the short story by Evelyn Woe called The Man Who Liked Dickens, about a man in South America held prisoner and forced to read Charles Dickens stories. King wondered what it would be like if Dickens himself was the one who was held captive. 
While that may be the basis, the story of Misery is more personal than that, as King later admitted that the book was really about his battles with drugs and alcohol, with Annie Wilkes being the stand-in for his addictions, keeping the author hostage and damaging him physically and mentally. One could also surmise that King himself was tired of being associated with just one genre of book, and had grown a bit weary of passionate fans hanging on his every word and then voicing their frustration when his work was not to their liking, which happened after his fantasy novel, The Eyes of the Dragon, was released a few years earlier. The book was published in June of 1987. It was met with some of the best reviews of King's career, but he did find some skepticism from those folks he was writing about, whether or not he was doing so intentionally. His loyal fans. In an article, King's wife Tabitha noted that certain faithful readers of the authors took the Annie Wilkes character to be a reflection of them, and they weren't too happy with what they saw. I have read several pained, angry, and offended letters from fans who mistakenly believe Steve was recording his true feelings about his readers in misery, Tabitha wrote before noting its exploration of the worst aspects of the celebrity fan connection is obvious and real. Whatever it was truly about, Misery was another hit for King, and like the majority of his books, seemed destined for the big screen. Only one problem, King did not want this one adapted. The author had been burned too many times in his still young career by what he thought were bad adaptations of his work, and he was not about to allow that to happen to Misery. Cut to producer Andrew Scheinman, co-founder of Castle Rock Productions, who was reading Misery on an airplane. Scheinman immediately saw cinematic possibilities in the short, tough novel and relayed as much to his partner at Castle Rock, Rob Reiner. Reiner was on a superb run as director, having helmed the horror-free Stephen King coming-of-age tale Stand By Me, the comedic fantasy The Princess Bride, and the mega-hit When Harry Met Sally, all back-to-back. -back. Reiner could relate a bit to the protagonist in Misery. After years of playing the affable lug Meathead on the iconic sitcom All in the Family, Reiner had much trouble breaking free of that perception of him when he wanted to get into directing films, which he finally did with the legendary mockumentary This Is Spinal Tap in 1984. Plus, he recognizes a good story when he reads one and had already gained King's trust with Stand By Me, one of the few adaptations of his work that the author genuinely liked. Furthermore, he had named his production company Castle Rock after King's famous fictional town, and that had to earn him some brownie points. Reiner and King had a meeting, and ultimately King agreed to sell the rights to the director for a buck. His only stipulation was Reiner had to either produce or direct it, to which Reiner agreed, although he didn't intend to direct it at first. Actually, to adapt Misery, Reiner reached out to William Goldman, the writer behind The Princess Bride book and screenplay. At the time, Goldman was one of the most famous screenwriters in all of Hollywood, responsible for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, All the President's Men, and Marathon Man, along with countless uncredited rewrites and script doctoring jobs. He was the go-to guy in town when your script needed work. Goldman read the novel, and that one scene really stood out. You know the one we're talking about. I could not effing believe it. Goldman went on to write in one of his memoirs, I knew she was going to tickle him with a feather, but I never dreamt such behavior was possible, and I knew I had to write the movie. Directing the film was originally going to be George Roy Hill, perhaps best known for directing the Best Picture winner, The Sting, in 1973. Hill had apparently agreed to do it at Reiner's behest, but when it came to that foot-chopping scene, he got cold feet, pun definitely intended, and dropped out. According to Goldman, Hill ended up saying, I was up all night and just could not hear myself saying action on that scene. So concerning was the gruesome but pivotal scene that Reiner decided to take an informal survey of the people who worked at Castle Rock. Should the scene stay or go? Eventually, the consensus was for it to stay in, but it would eventually get changed to make it slightly, just slightly, less horrifying. Reiner and producer Andrew Scheinman started doing their own drafts of the screenplay, and one of the key changes was that scene. The director decided to change it to Annie smashing Paul's foot with a sledgehammer, 
Not nice, not at all, but perhaps a bit less graphic than the foot coming clean off thanks to an axe. Goldman initially was not pleased. He thought that they had ruined what was going to be the biggest standout scene in the movie. He couldn't convince them to go back to the source material and later on would admit that he was wrong and they were right. The thinking being that if Annie had chopped off the foot, the audience reaction would have tainted the rest of the film. Figuring people would have told their friends to steer clear of the movie because of this disgusting scene. After George Roy Hill departed, Reiner took over directing duties, his first horror movie. The search for a lead actor to play Paul was on, and it turned out to be a rather tortuous process for Reiner. Actor after actor turned it down. From Jack Nicholson, to Dustin Hoffman, to William Hurt, to Richard Dreyfus. Dreyfus apparently expressed interest for a while, but eventually passed all the same. Goldman theorized that most of the actors passed because they saw the character of Paul as playing second fiddle to the much showier character of Annie. The actor who came closest to participating was Warren Beatty, who, while not formally committing to it, did some work on the script with Reiner. At the end of the day, however, he got nervous about the role. Goldman thought it was ultimately because of that foot bashing scene. Reiner still credits Beatty with making the script better than it was during the time that he was interested. Finally, Reiner found his Paul Sheldon in James Caan. At the time, Caan wasn't exactly the name that he was in the 70s and early 80s, but still enough of a recognizable actor that audiences were familiar with. Now came the crucial job of finding the right Annie Wilkes. Among the rumored names included Bette Midler and Angelica Houston, but both turned it down and would later say that they regretted the decision. It's been said that despite going after some A-listers, Reiner and company actually wanted an unknown for the part, an actress that audiences wouldn't recognize and who carried no baggage from prior big screen parts. Goldman claims it was his idea to cast Kathy Bates, who at the time was a highly respected theater actress with a handful of supporting roles in movies, but who was very far from being a household name. Bates was used to doing lots of rehearsal. Khan, on the other hand, liked to work with as little rehearsal as possible. While this wasn't a deal breaker by any means, it took some time for the actors to appreciate each other's methods and Reiner had to find a middle ground between the two opposing styles. At one point during the shoot, Bates relayed to Reiner that she was frustrated with Khan not listening to her, which prompted the director to say, you're right, he's not. His character doesn't care one iota about yours. Use that to fill your rage. I'll take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. In preparing to play a serial killer, which is what Annie Wilkes is revealed to be, Bates read up on people like Ted Bundy and other killers who were able to blend into society while committing their heinous crimes behind closed doors. As fate would have it, Bates knew about Annie before becoming attached to the film, as a friend of hers some years prior had handed her a copy of Misery and said, when they make a movie out of this, you should play Annie. Give that friend a bonus. Bates would say in a 1991 interview that she didn't consider Annie a monster in a horror movie, rather a human being who is a psychopath. Though she didn't go full method with her performance, Bates found it challenging to play Annie, especially towards the end of the shoot. She recalled feeling very disconnected from people, not enjoying the role, and one day Reiner, sensing her isolation, reminded her to leave her work at the studio at the end of every day and to not bring the baggage of playing the character home with her. Obviously, whatever she did worked. Khan said in a New York Times interview the next year, It didn't take much acting for me sometimes. Like when I think she's going to smash that thing in my head, she'd scare the hell out of you. In that scene, she was gone. Nevada stood in for some of the snowy mountains of Colorado, but the majority of the filming took place in a studio in Los Angeles, with the lion's share of the sequences taking place inside the bedroom where Paul is held captive. Khan and Bates later joked it was an exciting day whenever he got to move into any other section of the house. Khan would quip that Reiner hired the most neurotic actor in Hollywood, only to have him lie in bed for 15 weeks. It's for the best. Annie, please! Ah! 
When it came to shoot what would go on to become the film's most notorious scene, the hobbling, a pair of fake legs were made out of gelatin by k and Effects Group, who would go on to become Hollywood's go-to makeup and gore wizards. James Caan was in a bed with holes cut out at the bottom where his real legs would go, while the prosthetic legs were attached at his knees. But shooting the scene, which both Bates and Reiner apparently found to be very unpleasant, would take a toll on the feet themselves, which began to get rubbery, prompting artist Howard Berger to eventually attach a wire to the fake foot so he could hold it down after Bates whacked it with a sledgehammer. Another change in terms of gruesomeness was the death of the sheriff character, Buster, played by Richard Farnsworth. In the book, the sheriff is killed by Annie in a very Stephen King-like manner. She runs him over with a lawnmower. In the film, however, Buster is blasted in the back with a shotgun. Allegedly, Bates wanted the lawnmower scene in the movie, but Reiner was concerned it would look too silly on the big screen. So he opted for something a little more subtle. Or, I mean, as subtle as a shotgun blast can be. Misery was released by Columbia Pictures on November 30th, 1990, making it one of the more unusual holiday movies of the year. While it stepped right into the third week of the juggernaut known as Home Alone, Misery did mighty well for a movie with its subject matter, grossing $10 million during its opening weekend. It would then stick around throughout the winter, ultimately raking in around $61 million domestically. Last night it came so clear. I realize you just need more time. Eventually you'll come to accept the idea of being here. If the box office didn't solidify Misery as a movie to be taken seriously, the Academy certainly made it official when Kathy Bates won the Oscar for Best Actress in early 1991. Bates was considered a dark horse that year, with the well-known Angelica Houston, who of course turned down the Annie role, and Pretty Woman's Julia Roberts seen as the frontrunners. But Bates won it all the same. She thanked all of her collaborators and apologized publicly for the ankle bit. Bates naturally wondered if she was going to get typecast as a crazy person soon after, but obviously did not and still enjoys a career filled with diverse and eclectic roles. School? You going to school? Ah! Misery would later go on to be turned into a stage play written by William Goldman and starring Bruce Willis and Laurie Metcalf. And Annie Wilkes even got an origin story to call her own during the second season of the J.J. Abrams-produced Castle Rock, where she was portrayed by Lizzie Kaplan. The character will never likely be forgotten, and no doubt Annie would be pleased to know that she has more than a few number one fans of her own. She can't be dead. Misery Chastain cannot be dead.